Amen. Well, when I was younger in high school and school was out for the summer, I needed a summer job. And one of the many different various jobs that I had one summer was to be a fabric inspector. A fabric inspector. And this is a picture sort of what I was looking at day by day. I was working, I, I was living in Hickory, North Carolina at the time. Does anybody know anything about Hickory? It's the furniture capital of the world for manufacturing. High Point is the, man, is the furniture capital of the world for selling, but for actually making the furniture, Hickory, um, I guess there's 189 textile mills and plants and factories. And I was working at Hickory Chair as a summer high school worker, and they gave me this important job, which I, I think is important, to inspect all the rolls of fabric as they were brought in to, uh, to be then cut up for chairs and sofas and, and couches and everything else. And so I would take these rolls of fabric, I would put them on this big machine like this, and then I had a, a tool here that was kind of like a flagger. And you can see it up in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, I'd hold that little flagger, and whenever I saw some of this, all these are defects, defects in material and fabrics. And that's quite a bit more complicated than I remember. I just remember looking for two things. We were looking for misweaves, where the, the loom had, had kind of miswoven the fabric together, or we were looking for stains. Somehow after it was, was put together or fabric, it had gotten a stain somewhere. And when I saw those defects, it was my job to be watching as the, as the fabric is rolling past, and you could adjust the speed, and so that got fun too as you adjust the speed. Um, anyway, now what am I doing? I'm flagging where the defects are so that whenever on the side of the fabric I would just put a little tag there, it was a little red tag, at least what I remember, and it would, be, it would hang off the end of the fabric so that when it went to the next station, these are these giant plants, I mean huge plants, when it went to the next station they had these giant tables where people had these scissors that were like 18 inches long, and those were the cutters. And it was their job just to look for those flags and just to cut them out. They're not looking for any defects because they trusted yours truly to find them. And I was just a high school student and sometimes, you know, if I turn the machine up and it's moving faster, then I could get done quicker. But the problem, part of the problem with that was when they had this special fabric, you know, when it's just a plain uh, pattern like, let's go back for a second. When it's just a plain pattern, well, that's, you're not looking at much, and so it's not that difficult. But when there's a, a special elaborate, you know, we, weaving in and out in the colors and, and lines that are all, when you turn that up, you can get hypnotized just staring as it's just going by faster and faster, and like, was that something? Did I see something? Well, too late now. Well, oh, wait, well, quick, flag it. So, anyway, I, I was pleased to know that uh, this Whoa, uh, this particular uh, business is still in existence today. So they survived my fabric inspection. Uh, and they are still a production, you know, hickory chair, uh, large furniture producer. Last week we talked about how uh, God wants to refine and purify our characters so that we can stand when Jesus comes. And in so many ways, right now, during this time of the judgment, uh, there is a fabric inspection of our lives that God is examining, as we understand from Daniel 7 and the opening of the books, the, the defects in our lives. And God is not looking for defects so that he can uh, point out how bad we are. He's looking for defects so they can be cut out by the Holy Spirit. And they can be removed and cleansed and purified so that we'll be then reflecting of his character and able to stand when he comes. Well, just some, some setting for Revelation 7, as we look at just the background, the background comes from chapter 6, which was two weeks ago, and maybe you're like me, sometimes I, I forget things, a lot of times, just talk to my wife, but we notice these, uh, the seals, the opening of the seals, the first seal, the apostolic church, which takes us during the time of the apostles, the white horse, then we see the red horse, which is a time the church was persecuted, and I've got all the dates and stuff up over here. And then uh, the devil said, well, I tried to persecute the church, and that didn't work so well, so I'm going to bring in apostasy, which is false doctrines, false teachings. And that seemed to be a lot more effective, and that culminates in the fourth horse, this pale horse, the apostasy, which represents the Roman papal church. 
setting up and establishing itself from 538 uh, prophetically all the way to 1798. But then the Lord in His mercy cut that short, that long time period, with the Protestant Reformation, which was a revival of the Scriptures, bringing that back. But during the fifth seal, there were many martyrs who were persecuted and who were ultimately killed as a result of their faithful witness uh, to God during this fourth seal. And so the martyrs are crying out for two things. They're crying out for judgment. Have they been faithful and true to God? And vengeance on those who have mistreated and abused them. They were murdered or, or martyrs wrongfully so. They were innocent. And then we concluded with the sixth seal, which this is getting closer and closer to our day. Do you see that? That's what I'm trying to lead in. So it gets more and more important for us living today. As we notice at the end of chapter 6, the opening of the sixth seal, and the first half of the sixth seal is a herald or announcement of the time of God's judgment, which is what the martyrs were asking for in the fifth seal, for judgment and for vengeance. But then the second part of the sixth seal, the second coming of Jesus, is when those who have persecuted God's people will be held accountable and responsible for that. And we noticed under the sixth seal these signs that lead us all the way up to uh, the falling of the stars in 1833, the dark day in 1780, and the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. And so this final question though, who shall be able to stand, is so important. So important that we're going to find that chapter 7 largely deals with that. Now I know last week I talked about this at some degree, but we were studying in other places of the Bible uh, this, this question. It's so vital. I believe that we can either shrug it off and ignore it and just continue in a life of selfishness and sin. I would hasten to add, God forbid, for any of us. Or option number two, we can humble ourselves before God and ask Him to refine and purify us so that we can be ready and able to stand. Just also I will mention the sixth seal corresponds with the seventh church in the, se the sequence of the seven churches. Does anybody remember what the seventh church Laodicea means? People judge, judging of the people. And so we see this concept of judgment during the time of this sixth seal. So just now, the fabric of our characters is being examined by God Himself to determine if we have genuinely surrendered our lives into the hands of King Jesus to mold and to fashion as He wills. I'm always looking for little snippets to get your attention on the front end. And this is a statement Ellen White was writing in a letter to Stephen Haskell and his wife. And in that letter she quotes most of Revelation 7. Almost all of it, not all of it. She quotes it and then in the letter she writes and says, Let this chapter be carefully read and studied. We're going to carefully read and study it this morning. Wonderful things are about to transpire. And then she, she writes, the future is full of intense interest to every soul who shall live upon the earth. Study this chapter carefully. And so that is our plan this morning. And so I'm not going to ask if you have your Bibles because I know you do. This is the Hendersonville Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we always bring our Bibles to church. So if you would open up to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1, I'm going to try not to drag this morning, and we do have some significant things to study, but I will try to keep us moving along so that uh, we are done in time for the concert at 2.30. <laughs> you know me too well. Let's read the verse together, first of all, and this is following up the answer to the question, who shall be able to stand at the very end of chapter uh, 6. John writes, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And by the way, I, I just want to mention, this entire series of what I'm presenting in Revelation is, is I, I tried to uh, put this together with the idea of it being a visual commentary. Those of you that get lost with all the commentary and explanation, there are pictures and illustrations for every verse. There's 404 verses in Revelation, so just look at the pictures. Kids, look at the pictures, and that is intended to be a way of helping you conceptualize the information. Does that make sense? So it's a visual explanation or exposition of the book of Revelation. I hope that's exciting. 
So four angels, um, four corners of the earth. The four corners of the earth are just, you know, we have four principal directions from the compass, north, south, east, and west. Uh, the four corners just represents the entire world. And we see that God has given angels, angelic beings, uh, command over the forces of nature. Because winds, if you look at those in other places in Scripture, represent warfare, strife, conflict, and, and also natural disasters. Angels have authority over these things. In fact, uh, angels are very important in the ministration of God's people and the way God takes care of us. Psalm 91, a psalm of deliverance, the Bible says, For God, he shall give his angels charge over thee. And by the way, Satan, when he tempted Jesus, left this phrase out right here that's underlined and in bold. To keep thee in all my ways... That's not what it says. To keep thee in all thy ways, the ways that God would lead and guide. In all those ways, God has promised his angels to protect us. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. This is the counter to presumption because it's not my way, it's God's way that we have the guarantee of his angels to protect us. What about the earth and the sea or any tree? All these symbols are found in Scripture, other places. And the earth, in Revelation 13, there's a beast that arises out of the earth. And that is an area that's relatively sparsely populated. In the sea, that is a location, Revelation 17, verse 15, uh, an angel tells John, it represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, where there are lots of people. Or any tree. So we have sparsely populated areas, largely populated areas, or any tree. And there are several verses on this. I like Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. Who is described as a tree here? It says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In verses 1 and 2, it's describing uh, those who keep and follow the commandments of God. This is the righteous are likened to a tree. You don't have to guess at all. The Bible explains itself. And so not hurting the trees would mean the angels are holding the winds of strife so that even God's people are preserved and protected. Here's a statement that illuminates this a little bit more. Testimonies to Ministers, page 444. John sees the elements of nature and then earthquake, tempest, and political strife represented as being held by who? Four angels. Is that what we just read in Revelation 7, verse 1? All of these things would be included in what the angels are restraining. These winds are under control until God gives the word to let them go. And if you keep reading and studying, you find that these angels hold the four winds until Jesus finishes his work in the most holy place. And when he finishes his work in the most holy place, that is when the angels are going to let go of the winds of strife. And the seven last plagues will be poured out, and it will be a serious time of trouble. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, we're given this counsel. Time is very short, and all that is to be done must be done how? Quickly. The angels are holding the four winds. Is that Revelation 7 verse 1? Yes, it is. And Satan is taking advantage of everyone who is not fully established in the truth. It's just like the children's story that we heard from Vicky. He studies human weakness, and he's got his lures for all of us, and he's doing all that he can to distract us, to deceive us, and to destroy us during this important time. And it continues and says, every soul is to be tested. Every one of us, you can't shirk or skip or or pass or, or ignore the test. We all will be tested. Every defect in the character, unless it is overcome by the help of God's Spirit, will become a sure means of destruction. Sobering thoughts. Verse 2. John says, And I saw another angel ascending from what location? The east, having the what? The seal of what God? The living God. I've wondered why does it specifically, you know, mention the living God and just, just doesn't just say just the seal of God. And I think that's just to highlight the fact that all other false gods are dead. They're not really gods. There's only one living God, and that is the one who has the seal of God, this seal of approval. What, what is this? Let's continue reading, though. 
this angel ascends, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. We're going to look here uh, this morning and spend some time at noticing what is the seal of God and what is significant about this seal. A seal is always, always connected with law. Always. So that's a key thought to keep in mind. It is inseparable from a seal. And a seal is also used to make an impression on wax, which is also significant because we're going to find that God wants to make His character impression on our lives so that we are a representation of Him and we reflect His life. Notice this statement, John's attention was called to another, another scene where in, in verse 2 he sees another angel ascending from the east, and then the servant of the Lord asks, who is this? I love it when she asks a question and then answers it. And then she answers, the angel of the covenant. He, this angel, comes from the sun rising. He is the day spring from on high. He is the light of the world. Do you have any guesses who this might be? In him is life, and the life was the light of men. This is Jesus himself. Jesus is the one who is the angel ascending from the east. And it reminds me of Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 where it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness do what? Arise. The sun arises in what direction? The east with healing in his wings. The son of righteousness, Jesus Christ, is the angel who is ascending and has this special mark that is for God's people. Well, let's ask this question. What is the seal of God? In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, we read this verse that simply says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. That God's people are supposed to be bound and sealed based on their loyalty and their obedience to His law. And a law is not valid unless it has a seal which shows the authority of the one who is issuing the law. Does this make sense to you? If the governor of North Carolina were to pass a law, would it have any effect in South Carolina? Why not? The governor of North Carolina does not have authority over South Carolina or Tennessee or Virginia. If the President of the United States were to sign a law, would it have any effect in Canada or in Mexico? It would not because the President does not have authority. He might have influence, that's different, but he does not have authority over those areas, those territories. So we find that the seal of God is found in connection with the law of God, and it includes three essential elements. It includes the name of the person who is issuing the law, it includes their title, and it includes their territory. And this is just up here as an example, the seal of the President of the United States, and this could be for any president, but if it were the current president, it would be the name, of course, is President Joseph Biden, and his title is president, and then there's his title right there, and then where is his territory that he has authority over of the United States of America? So the seal of God is found in the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And I've highlighted up here the key aspects of those three important ingredients that every seal must contain. Every seal must contain these three. So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The Seventh day Adventist church? Oh no. We follow and keep it because it's His Sabbath, and He invites us to enter into His rest on the Sabbath day. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now here it comes. For in six days the Lord did what? He made. He is the maker, he is the creator, and then it, it lists his territory, heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And then he rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we find all three of those ingredients or those uh, essential elements in the fourth commandment and only in the fourth commandment. So the seventh day Sabbath is a sign or it's a seal of loyalty to God. Do you love God this morning? Certainly, you're here at church. It's the Sabbath day. 
But the scriptures make so clear that the Sabbath is more than just an intellectual understanding, but rather it's a reflection of a spiritual experience and a relationship that we have with God. Resting and trusting that He can take care of me for my physical needs, because I'm not out trying to work and earn my, my, my financial bread and water on today, and He's also able to take care of completely my spiritual needs. Does that make sense? Physically and spiritually. And there's other places in scriptures that make this clear. Uh, Exodus 31, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. And what does it say? Whose Sabbaths are they? Mine, the Lord, the Creator, my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does what to you? How do you know God sanctifies you and that He purifies and can save you completely and entirely? It's because of the gift and the promise of the Sabbath. As He completed and rested on the seventh day Sabbath from all of His work and creation, He has given us an example of our completed work in salvation as we rest and trust in Him. It is a sign that God is the one who provides for all of our needs, and we can rest in assurance of His provisions. Great Controversy, page 452. The seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. This only, only of all the ten brings to view both the name and the title of the lawgiver. It declares him to be the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so what's, so, what's the big deal, Pastor, about that? Why does that matter so much? Notice continuing, and thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above how many others? All others, because he is the creator. We're sitting here this morning because we owe our existence to him. He is the one that has given us life and sustains our lives as the creator. Now, verse 3, what else uh, did this angel, which is a representation, I believe, of Jesus. There's other places in Scripture that talk about Jesus as the angel of the covenant at the burning bush of Moses, um, at Abraham and Isaac when he was offering Isaac as a sacrifice, or going to, the angel of the covenant appeared. Christ was the one who was there. Verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in what location? In their foreheads. And, and so I want to bring this, reel this in just a little bit. This is something that's happening right now. This, this sealing time, don't, don't go to sleep just yet. This is happening right now and has the greatest importance to our thinking and our understanding. And so remember, so the angel here, which was Christ, says, Do not hurt the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So brothers and sisters, it seems like there's a delay in the coming of Jesus. Since we have studied prophecy from our beginning, 1844, going onwards, what is the cause for the delay? It's because we are not sealed and ready for His coming, to stand in His presence. And He's saying, Wait, wait, hold, the, hold back all the destruction that's coming on this world until they've had the chance to make a decision to surrender all to me. Hold back. The delay is because of us in our forehead. So what is significant about the forehead? It represents our choices. The mind right inside the, the very front of our brain is our, where we make our decisions. And I would submit this is the essence of who you and I are right in the front part. It's not my elbow and it's not my knee. It's right here where Brian Heinemann makes decisions and choices that affect everything else. So this must be placed here. And it's also, I know this is just an artist drawing. This is just, it's, it's not a literal mark. Revelation is symbolic. It is a spiritual mark of those who have chosen to fully accept God and, and, and their loyalty to Him. Statement from uh, Selected Messages, as wax takes the impression of the seal, so the soul, that is our lives, is to take the impression of the Spirit of God and retain the image of Christ. Do you see the, the significance of that? It's not just the seal for the sake of this belongs to me. It's also this is a representation of me and it reflects who I am, my character, my image. Morally, physically, we were created in the image of God. Those who receive the seal of God reflect the life and the character of God. 
Interesting statement from early writings, page 38, on Jesus as this uh, fourth, or this angel that was ascending from the east. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant. I believe that's you and I. Then raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Continuing next paragraph, Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God, who sat upon the great white throne, and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth, and waving something up and down in his hand, and crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. They have made the decision and fully submitted and surrendered their lives to me to be purified and refined as my own. I think of the, the precious hymn, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by while this work of sealing is taking place. May God help us to be in total surrender and submission to him so that he can set his seal of approval on each one of us. All right, we got a ways to go. Let's keep moving. And I heard, verse 4, the number of them which were sealed, and <clears throat> if someone could get me a glass of water, that'd be great. There's, I got a cup in the back uh, sitting down there in the, the refrigerator. I apologize. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. I want you to notice that John hears the number that were sealed. He does not see them. And that has significance as we look here in just a moment uh, at these two different groups we're going to see, the 144,000. Thank you, Valen. That's even spring water, my favorite. All right, I'm not, I'm not as prepared as Pastor Wright. I should bring my a water bottle up here every week. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there's even a little place for it to sit right there. Much better. Thank you. So John hears the number that were sealed, 144,000, it says, of all the tribes of Israel. And we're going to find that, I'm going to have lots of water in a minute. All of these tribes that are depicted here are representation, they are character snapshots of the people that will be sealed by God because God has transformed their lives and their characters. The, although it says uh, sealed from Israel, we've noticed in Revelation that it's symbolic. And so the fact that it's symbolic, um, these are not literal Jews. Let me, let me just read here uh, verses 5 through 8. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of, Re of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And finally, of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Each of these tribes, just like the seven churches, had different names, and the meaning of the names had significance to the character and the time period of that church. I, I think there's also some connection with the names of these 12 tribes and the meaning of that name and how it represents God working and transforming. If you do a case study of all of these people, these different uh, 12 tribes, you'll find that they all had their flaws. Many of them were deeply flawed, but praise the Lord, God is still able to save and to seal them. Does that make sense to you? The big picture, and I'm going to keep moving on, is that God is able to transform even some people that we look and read stories, for example, about Judah and how he slept with, you know, the prostitute and then did some other strain. I mean, God was able to save and transform Judah so that people that are like that are sealed when Jesus, before Jesus comes. Does that make sense to you? Do you see that? All right, well, let's just keep moving on as we read those verses about the names of the tribes and how it re represents something to do with their character. When a, a son was born, oftentimes the mother would say something that was related to their name or their birth. So, 
verse 9. These are not literal Jews. I should add that the, the New Testament teaches that spiritual Israel is the church. The 144,000 are, are not literal Jews. They are representative of all the people around the world. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are, are, are who the first angel's message is sent to and given to. And so all people from every nation, c- country, t- uh, kindred, tongue, and people are sealed by God because he is no respecter of persons. Verse 9, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Notice John sees this group, but he only heard about the 144,000. And I'm, 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 you're, you're, I'm in a little bit of a bind here because there are two different schools of thinking on these groups. Uh, some people that I have a lot of confidence in believe these are two separate groups, uh, the 144,000 and the great multitude, and there's some other people who believe they are the same group. And you might say, well, how is that possible? And I'm leaning towards that understanding that the great multitude is the same as 144,000. At first glance, it seems impossible because the great multitude cannot be numbered, and the 144,000 is a definite number. But there's something in Revelation called juxtaposition where two ideas that are, are, are mentioned side by side are apparently contradictory. I'll give you one other example in Revelation 5. John hears the lion of the tribe of Judah is able to open the scroll. And the very next verse, when he looks and sees, he hears the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then he sees the what? The lamb, as it had been slain. At first glance, what connection does a lamb and a lion have together? Seemingly nothing but yet they represent different times or phases of Jesus' ministry. The lamb as he had been slain for our sacrifice, but later on the lion who will be King Jesus conquering and protecting and defending his people. And so the 144,000 are numbered, representing they are protected by God during the time of trouble and the great tribulation, which we're going to read about. And then the great multitude, which no one could number, are the other side of the time of trouble. The great multitude stand victorious with Jesus. And so it's the same group at different times. And so I'm still weighing that out in my mind. You're, you're free to have your own interpretation, but uh, I have a lot still to learn. And so that's just where I'm at at the moment. I, I'm not pushing one, one way or another because I was on the other side, and now I'm kind of shifting over to the other way. But it shows God's power to preserve, protect his people, and ultimately to rescue and deliver them. These two different groups. And how, what, is, how are these, what is this group described as? Clothed with white robes. You know, clothing is a symbol for character. And so the fabric inspector illustration at the beginning, the character that we want to have is a character that's Jesus. And righteousness by faith is receiving his character, his righteousness, in place of our own. It's the great exchange in Zechariah 3, take away the filthy garments from him, Joshua, who was the high priest, who stood as a representative for all the people, and then give him the robe of the righteousness of Christ, an exchange that takes place. And then palm branches. So this is showing God's people that have preserved, persevered through the time of trouble. They have come through that, and they stand victorious with palm branches in their hands, which is a symbol of victory, rejoicing and victory because of God. Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. And here's the reason why. For he hath clothed me with the garments of what? Garments of salvation. There's the close connection. He hath covered me with the what? Robe of righteousness. And it describes this kind of robe. It's so beautiful. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. As a, the, the members of a wedding party get dressed up in their very best to go and, and present themselves on this special occasion, so too does God present us with the very best of his righteousness because he loves us so much. Now, verse 10, and cried with a loud voice, saying, This is the great multitude, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Only God could provide salvation for the human race. Amen? And God, the Father, and Jesus share in this jointly together in the plan of redemption. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the apostles said, While they were on trial before the Sanhedrin, neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is attributed wholly and entirely to God because only He could bring that about. Verses 11 and 12, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshiped God. And then it says in verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And this is just beginning, now this fast forwards the scene to the glorious future that stretches out before us. When God promises that we will live with Him for all eternity, rejoicing and giving praise to Him. There's a verse I like to quote here often at this church, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Psalm 113 verse 3, God is to be praised all day long, and we will be doing that when we get to heaven in thanksgiving and gratitude for what He has done for us. Notice this very interesting statement from Patriarchs and Prophets 595. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised, and a life of probation was granted to man. To bring him or her back to the, what's the word? Back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life. God wants to perfect you and I this morning so that He can place His seal upon us. This is the object that underlies every other. All right, notice together 13 and 14. We're going to bring this, this wagon in. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Interesting, the, uh, it doesn't come across in English the same way that it does in the Greek, where it says, These have come out of great tribulation. The, the Greek says, These have come out of tribulation, the great one. It, the great one is a definite reference, I believe, to the time of trouble. All Christians, in a general sense, go through tribulation to enter the kingdom of God, hardships and trials. But the great one is the one that the, 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 the 144,000 and the, the great multitude have passed through, and God has rescued and delivered them. They, are, um, they stand through the outpouring of the seven last plagues, which are what occur when the four angels let loose the winds of strife. They have washed their robes. Each of them have led, have had their life washed in the blood of Christ. Thus they have washed their lives in the life of Christ, and it is Christ's life that is being revealed in them, a life filled with righteousness. This is one of my memory verses, 1 John 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from, what's the word? All sin. There is no sin that Jesus' blood cannot cleanse. None at all. That He is not able to cleanse and wash away. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah 1.18. This interesting commentary for what this verse is referring to, where it talks about washing our robes and having them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is now our washing and ironing time. The time when we are to cleanse our robes of character in the blood of the Lamb. John says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And then I love the comment of the servant of the Lord, I thank thee, my heavenly Father. I, I thank thee that thou hast given us Jesus to take away our sins. And she asked such a, a very penetrating question, Shall we not let him take them away? Shall we not let our sins go to wash and have them ironed? And, and fully pressed, ready for Jesus to come, our robes of character. Verse 15, Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Can you just wait for Jesus to dwell with you? 
to live and to live in his presence forever and ever and ever, to be before the throne of God and to stand in his presence. This group of people, I pray, which all of us will be part of, their greatest desire is to serve and worship God day and night in his temple. And this verse kind of echoes that sentiment. Psalm 27, verse 4, the psalmist says, One thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Verse 16, this is again describing the glorious picture of the future stretched out before us to those who are sealed, to those who go through this hard time, the, the glorious glimpse of what is before us that God promises. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. And those are some of the things that we see under the, the seven last plagues, the, the plagues that, that fall upon the, the wicked with the intense heat and the scorching earth. Uh, and some of those things, those will never ever again happen in God's heaven. Once in heaven, the righteous shall never hunger or thirst again. John 16, 33, this verse has comforted and cheered me many times when I go through difficult times. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. It's unavoidable. We live in a sinful world, but Jesus is coming to bring us back to the state of perfection and restore us and have his seal, which is his character and his name, his life impressed on our own. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then it closes out here, continuing this beautiful picture of the future. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The sermon this morning is entitled, No More Tears. Are you tired of crying? Um, tired of the, the pain and the heartaches of this world? I am. I am. But there's a time coming when it says the lamb himself is revealed as the shepherd. Notice the lamb is feeding them. The lamb is leading them to fountains of waters. Usually you think that's the shepherd. But of course, Jesus is the good shepherd as well. John 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So I believe that the food and the water Jesus is speaking of here and that John is writing about is both physical and spiritual. The physical food that we need to eat with the table in heaven and the, the, the physical water that we need to drink from the water of the river of life that flows out of the throne of God as well as the spiritual food, which is the word of God. And the spiritual water, which is the message of salvation that Jesus was talking about to the woman at the well, John 4:14, 4, that if we receive him, that we will have a fountain of water springing up within us, which is a fountain of salvation that others can drink from to know about him. So Isaiah 25, verse 8, no more tears. I believe that Revelation is alluding to this verse right here in the Old Testament. He, God, will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. All the, the names you've been called, all the hate that has been, been thrown at God's people during the time of trouble for staying loyal and true to God, God says, I'm going to take away the rebuke. And then he gives this added certainty and guarantee, for the Lord hath spoken it. And there's nothing more eternal and, and powerful in this, in this life than the Word of God. There's nothing more meaningful, more powerful. So I'm going to close with this statement here. My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds how often? Continually. And let them crowd out worldly thoughts and cares. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. And here comes the counsel for you and for I. Live and act wholly in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is what? Very short. That's what we're studying this morning. This whole chapter is really those who are sealed and what they're able to accomplish because of the, the power of God. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time. Now is the time while the four angels, that's Revelation 7 verse 1, while the four angels are holding the four winds to make our calling and election sure. 
And that's 2 Peter 1 verse 10 that we are given counsel there to make our calling and election sure. And so I'm going to quickly review these key points and we'll come to a close for today. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Through the ministration of angels, God is restraining the winds of strife and destruction on earth. We should praise God for His uh, safety and provision that He's given to us now. God is in the process now, now, of sealing His servants who choose to be faithful and loyal to Him. The seal of God is contained in the fourth commandment. And that's Exodus 20, 8 through 11. The 144,000 are God's saints who will stand through the trials of the last days. And then finally, the righteous saints will have the privilege of living with Jesus in perfect joy and happiness for all eternity. Can't even read my own notes. It will all be worth it. I promise you. Because God promises. <laughs> 